Many of us are like that man who is described as living his life at a safe distance from his own body. We use our body, we are with the body, and yet for some reason we're apart from it. We can block it out very easily. At times when we're forced to be aware of it, we find that it's painful, so it makes us want to block it out all the more. But the mind, when it's blocking things out that way, is hiding huge areas of itself from itself as well, and doesn't have a good solid grounding in the present moment. Without that grounding, and without having a sense of well-being in the body, you can end up doing anything, saying anything, speaking, thinking anything, doing anything, because it's not coming from a position of strength. One of the reasons we meditate is to get the mind back into the body. And it may take a while, but we don't just sit here and put up with the pains. We need some tools so we can get back into the body and feel comfortable being here. This is why we work with the breath. Not only the in and out breath, but also the other breath energies throughout the body. Just learning how to think about the body in those terms. It's not a solid lump of tension here. You've got some energy flowing around. Without that energy, the body couldn't function at all. And so it, we're trying to get in touch with that, just the feeling of being here with the body. And finding the areas that we can make comfortable. Think of a John Lee's image. You're going into a house, and some of the floorboards in the house are rotten. So you make sure you don't step there. And if you're going to lie down, you certainly don't lie down there. You lie down in the areas where the floorboards are sound. So try to find an area of the body that you can make comfortable by the way you breathe. It might be in the center of the body, or you might have to start out at the periphery. In other words, working from the hands and the feet on in. whatever seems to work best with the body. So you have a grounding here, have a sense of well-being. Give the mind some pleasure here to feed off of, because the mind is constantly feeding. Now, as the Buddha said, the feeding is related to suffering, because the term for feeding or taking sustenance is also the same as the word for clinging. But the Buddha thought strategically. He realized that you couldn't just stop feeding off form, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. If you forced yourself to stop, the, there are parts of the mind where you're sneaking out for a midnight snack. You've got to give the mind a good source of food inside. And when the Buddha is talking about food in terms of the practice, concentration is the main food learning how to be with the body, with a sense of well-being. And that gives you the strength to f perform all the other tasks of the path. So always remember that. The Buddha thought strategically. In the ancient world, they made a distinction between scribe knowledge and warrior knowledge. And the Buddha's knowledge is warrior knowledge. It's aimed at taking a certain, attaining a certain goal and using whatever strategies are needed to get there. Unfortunately, a lot of what we learn about the Dharma has been filtered through scribes. Not only the people who copied down the text, but also the people who commented on them and tried to develop a philosophy around them. There's very much a scribe-like philosophy. I've been reading a couple of books recently on the Eightfold Path, written by people trained in the scholarly tradition. And their approach is very strange. They say consciousness, they say, is basically a passive, but it has a map of reality. But the map of reality is all wrong. It thinks that it has a permanent self. 
And so when things come up, it goes from its passive, pure state into a reactive state, trying to grab onto things for its permanent self. And that's why it suffers. If it didn't think in terms of self, it wouldn't suffer. So they teach you to be non-reactive, to have no judgments. Just try to be as non-reactive as possible, as equanimous as possible. And that will be the end of the problem, until you can, can see that the Buddha's map, which says there is no permanent self, is the correct map. Once you confirm it's the correct map, then you won't be reactive anymore. You can see it's a scribe-like way of thinking about things in terms of definitions and maps of reality. Warriors use maps too, but they use them for a different purpose. They use the map to gain something else beside the map. They're not there just to confirm that the map is true. And when the Buddha looks at the way the mind acts, he sees that it requires strategy. Because we cling to things, not because we have a false idea that they're permanent. We cling to them because we feel that whatever effort goes into clinging is worth it because of the pleasure we get. We feed off that pleasure. So even if we don't believe that there's a permanent self or that things have a permanent essence, we still cling to them, as long as we see that it's worth the effort that goes into gaining them. And the Buddha's final judgment, of course, is no, it's not worth the effort, but he doesn't tell you to stop holding on to things. He gives you better things to hold on to. You hold on to the practice of virtue. You hold on to the practice of concentration. You hold on to discernment as your tools. And you feed off the well-being that these things can provide. So it gives you an alternative source of food. And when you're better fed, the mind is not so worked up around things. Ultimately, it gets to a happiness, or we can see an opening to a happiness inside that doesn't require feeding. And that's why you stop having to feed. It's not telling yourself that, gee, my stomach is impermanent and food is impermanent and therefore I should, I'll just stop eating. You're going to have to eat as long as there's a body and as long as there's a mind functioning. But there is this happiness inside that's unfabricated, and you attain it through a fabricated path. This is the strategic part of the Buddhist teaching. You have to develop certain qualities that eventually you put aside. This is why the duties of the path fall into two sections. One is you develop the path so it does its work, and then finally you let it go. And John Mon expresses this by saying that you start with the Four Noble Truths. Actually, prior to that, you start with mundane right view, which is a belief in karma. And that moves into the Four Noble Truths, because after all, craving the cause of suffering is an unskillful form of action. The path is a skillful form of action. The path is a type of karma, but it's a special type of karma. It leads to the end of karma. It's also a special type of fabrication. because it gets you to the unfabricated. But you have to develop it first. And then once it's developed and it's done its work, that's when you let it go. We talk about the Four Noble Truths because there are four duties. Stress is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. Cessation is to be realized. And the path is to be developed. But then, as in John Munn's comment, they collapse into one. There's just one duty that goes with that, and that's letting go. So we're fabricating a path, but it will lead us to the unfabricated, which means that you can't just clone awakening. You can't pretend that you don't need to feed. You do need to feed. So feed well. 
find a source of food that, unlike most pleasures of the world, doesn't involve any, any bad karma and also doesn't involve clouding the mind. When the mind gets concentrated, it's a lot clearer. You can see things. We can see what's going on inside the mind. It puts you in a position to see where the mind is causing itself unnecessary suffering. The Buddha's image is of a man standing at the edge of a pool, and the water in the pool is still and clear. So you can see what's there in the pool. So when the mind gets concentrated with a sense of well-being, it calms down. Once it's been well-fed by pleasure and rapture, then it can let the pleasure and rapture go, and go with just the subtle pleasure of equanimity. And that's when it can see things clearly inside. Because this equanimity is different from the equanimity of just saying, well, things don't matter. That's what's called householder equanimity, and it's involved with suffering. Because you've pretty much given up on the idea that the aggregates can provide any happiness. And so you just say, well, just give up on the idea of happiness and try to find some peace in being equanimous. The Buddha was not a warrior who gave up. He found that we can turn these aggregates into the path. Like when we're doing concentration, you've got the body here, that's form. The breath, that's form. You've got the feeling of pleasure that comes from staying with the breath. There's the perceptions that hold you with the breath and allow the breath to get more evenly spaced throughout the body, evenly spread throughout the body with a sense of well-being. There's the fabrications of directed thought and evaluation. There's consciousness. You've got all the aggregates right here. But you're not just saying, well, gee, these aggregates are impermanent, so I'll let them go. You use them. In the Buddhist image, you bind them together. You make a raft out of them. And then you make the effort to go across to the other side. Once you've got to the other side, then you can put them aside. So the Buddha is not telling you to give up on your hopes for happiness or give up on the aggregates. He's just saying this is how you use them to find a happiness that's really reliable, that doesn't turn into anything else, a happiness where there's no hunger. So as we practice, we want to take a warrior's approach. We're not here just to believe the Buddha's map. His map is not a map of reality. It's more of a map of processes as they happen. The processes of how the mind creates suffering and how it can use those same processes with knowledge so that it doesn't create suffering. It's a different kind of map based on the realization that we hold on to things not because we think they're permanent. We hold on to things because we think that the effort of giving rise to them and clinging to them will bring a happiness that's worth the effort. And the Buddha is telling us to use our faculty of judgment. We don't put our judgments aside. We learn to be more discerning about where stress really is and where real pleasure is, real happiness is. The insights that are going to come are value judgments as to what's worth the effort and what's not, and an effort that can take you to a happiness that will then not require any more effort. That's the best sort of effort of all, because it does have an endpoint. Otherwise our awareness, which is not passive, is constantly actively looking for food. If it doesn't have a happiness that's doesn't require food, it's going to keep on searching for food. And the problem is that to search for food, you take on an identity, and to have that identity, you need to feed. It's a vicious cycle. We're taking a different identity now as meditators that will take us to a, a source of food or a type of nourishment that doesn't require feeding anymore, doesn't require any effort anymore. And that's when we can put all our burdens down. So think like a warrior, and think like a warrior who's headed toward victory and not to a resigned defeat. Because victory is possible. And it's worth all the struggle to get there.